How's it going? Hey, it's going good. How are you? I'm great. Why don't happy you... Friday. Yeah, happy Friday. All right. Come on in. Thank you. Yeah. So my name is Dr. Simone Douglas Green. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the chemical engineering department at MIT, and I'm advised by Dr. Paula Hammond. This is our lab. Welcome in. Um, my bench is back here, so why don't you come on, follow me? Go ahead and work from here. Great. So first, first things first, uh, what's up for today? What are the things that you did this week? Um, kind of regular stuff. Oh yeah, so let's see. Um, did a little bit of writing this week and some experimental planning. I'm working on designing some new nanoparticles. We'll, we'll call it, leave it at that. Okay. Um, I also did some harvesting of some cartilage so I can do some experiments starting next week. Awesome. Snow pending. Hopefully the roads are clear so I can do that. Yeah. Um, I've got a fantastic group of undergrads working with me. So um, right now it's the IAP period for um, at MIT. So they've been in lab way more often, which has been great. I've been able to connect with them more and just see them grow and work independently on their projects. And some of them are going to be doing mini presentations for me later. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. So what is your main research question? My main research question, so I'm designing um, charged nanocarriers for delivery to treat um, osteoarthritis. Um, but more specifically, what I'm looking at are the proteins that can adsorb to the surface of those nano nanocarriers. That way we can improve um, targeting and uptake um, to achieve therapeutic potential and efficacy. Awesome. Is this something you did previously in grad school or... Before that? No, no, I was looking more at um, blood clotting factors actually. Um, so, um, how did you transition to the field of cartilage? Yeah, so sometimes you just kind of go where, where your research desire yeah. just <laughs> sails you to. Um, so, the, the, the real backstory is I've always been interested in drug delivery systems mm -hmm. and um, therapies and all of that. But in grad school, I met my advisor, Dr. Manu Platt, and I thought he was fantastic. So word of advice, um, sometimes like for grad school or your PhD, a project is great, but having a great advisor and mentor is super important. So we connected and um, his work in, in his lab was focusing on tissue regeneration and repair. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were really looking at these proteases called cathepsins in various um, tissue destructive diseases. The one that I was actually focusing on was sickle cell disease and the blood clotting that occurs in that. So that's how all of that fits in together. But on the other end, from a tissue engineering perspective, I was looking at microvascular networks and how those were being um, degraded by the cathepsins. And the common theme that, com that um, unifies all of this, aside from cathepsins, is fibrin or fibrinogen, which is an essential blood clotting factor. Um, so if you look at my thesis, it's like this nice web of like, I think it's really beautiful work, you know, compliment myself because you should definitely yourself hype yourself up. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I got into that. I learned how to do great research, ask questions, experimental planning, all of that under um, advising by Dr. Platt. And then postdoc, this is the opportunity for me to do drug carrier systems. I saw that um, Dr. Hammond, who's been one of my sheroes in science, um, that she had a postdoc opening and things just kind of fell into place from there. Awesome. Um, and then you went to grad school and undergrad where? Yeah, so for undergrad, I did biomedical engineering at the University of Miami. And then for my PhD, um, I was at um, Georgia Tech and Emory in their joint PhD program. Fantastic. What did you like about your training environments, uh, like the current one and the ones before? I think in terms of in environments, it's just, it's nice to be not only among like-minded um, thinkers and people who are just interested in pursuing science and you know, the excitement of discovery, yeah. but also just having a really good support system. I think um, if anything, this pandemic has shown me that it's really important, especially when you're distanced, whether it's literally miles apart or like you're just on it and you're just on a Zoom call and maybe someone's a couple blocks down because you can't all get together physically. Yeah. I think it's important having that support system to be able to, to, to uplift you, especially during the, the rough times, but also just bounce ideas off of each other, um, especially as someone coming into a newer field. I've been relying a lot 
on um, other postdocs and grad students who have more expertise in the chemical engineering because I am a biomedical engineer by training and I'm learning a lot of new things. Yeah, great collaborations going on. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, so how has being a postdoc in like the pandemic times been? Because I know it's been quite different from you know, other postdoc experiences before then. Yeah, I what I'll say is that with um, being in the being in the pandemic, I think. Well, actually, I think the best thing to say is when I was up for my one year review. So I started September 2020, mm -hmm. and August 2021, I was having my one year review with Dr. Hammond, and um, she'd asked me, "So, how's the first year been?" And because of all the limited time in lab, because we had specific working schedules and shutdown, all of that, mm -hmm. everything together. Um, I didn't feel like I had been here for a full year. Yeah. So a lot of skills that you would expect to have by your one year and you, you just, you don't have it or you don't have the training. It's taking me, taking me a year to get an, some animal training done. Wow. And so, and it's just all because of restrictions, but you have to give yourself grace and also just be accommodating to people around you because we're trying to live in this pandemic. And first and foremost, we're, we're people before we're scientists. So Definitely. we have to be be respectful of that and just be kind to yourself, really. Yeah. What do you do for hobbies? Um, I did find the one place that I gravitated towards was walking down the Charles River, especially when I first started here um, during like incubation times or just mm -hmm. I'm waiting for things to run. Um, I've been getting to know some of my lab mates more recently, especially as you know restrictions have eased up a bit. So it's been... I think it's really nice comfort, you know, what your comfort level is if you can get outside of lab and get to know your lab mates and try hard not to talk about science and just yes. you know, get to know each other. Definitely see the value. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, one of the big things um, after someone gets their PhD is they celebrate their defense. Mm -hmm. So what did you do to celebrate your defense? Yeah, so for um, my defense, so I was one of the first people in my program to defend virtually. Um, and I tried really hard to recreate some of that in-person experience. So one of the traditions that my lab had is that, um, well, lab mates would bring in food, but usually there's a theme. So my theme was welcome to Jamrock because um, um, I'm Jamaican. Both my parents are from Jamaica, although I was born here in the U.S. And um, so what I did was I encouraged um, people to buy food from local Caribbean restaurants to be able to support awesome. small businesses. Um, and then also rather than, and usually once you're announced for the first time, like introducing Dr. Simone Douglas Green and everything, well, it was just Douglas at the time. That's another story. Yeah. But um, what I did was um, we did it virtually. So I'd set up a separate um, blue jeans because we use blue jeans at, in Atlanta, or down at um, Georgia Tech. I'd set that up that way. We could kind of recreate that moment. And it was really nice. A lot of my closest friends, lab mates, family was there. And I think that's one of the advantages of actually doing a virtual defense. I had family from Jamaica joining me. Some of my, my old um, undergrad research advisor watched me. So it was, it was really nice. There was a lot of people there and I definitely felt the love. Awesome, that's great. Um, and then you got married once you moved here? Yeah, so um, Congratulations. I, thank you. <laughs> so in addition to a pandemic defense, I also had a pandemic wedding. Um, and a lot of milestones. Yes, yeah, um, a lot happened during the pandemic. So um, after I defended, I went back down to Florida and um, we actually, because um, our big wedding, we had to move that back. Um, so we still wanted to get married and, and move to Boston together as a married couple. So we got married in my parents' backyard. How um, do you, um, you know, advise, like what is good practices, um, something that you learned from your previous mentors? Because I know you're responsible for someone's also like academic development. Yeah. So how do you handle that? So what I like to do when I get a new student is one, set up expectations, expectations I have of them, they have of me and they have of themselves, usually something like that. Um, I also like to ask them, what do they want to get out of this experience? Um, because some, some students come in, they, they don't understand or they don't, um, they don't know what they want to do in the future career wise. Others know exactly what they want to do. So I want to make sure that I'm helping them grow as a scientist, but also just outside of the lab. Because I think there's a lot of transferable skills that you learn in the lab that can be applied outside as well. That's very true. Um, and then uh, kind of what are some uh, coping mechanisms uh, that you like to impart, uh, especially being in science, you know, not everything works out. 
the five percent that works out. Yeah, I say you know when you have the wins, celebrate the wins. Definitely, um, be humble about it, but celebrate them. And then on the days when things aren't going so great, it's one thing that I like to remind myself and others is that the experiment failed. You are not a failure. Those are two different things. Because I think we, and this happened to me, especially halfway through grad school, I tied myself and my worth to my work. Mm -hmm. So when my work didn't seem like it was being pro like being productive and producing and getting results, then I felt like that was the case. But but that's not the case. It's very, it is, a, I guess it is a very deep way of thinking. And it, I think it's one of those things that you will learn and mature with mm -hmm. um, as you grow on, you know, on your scientific journey and everything. That's awesome. So speaking of, uh, you know, experiments not going as planned, what do you do when you get like unexpected results? So unexpe I was just talking to a second year grad student about this um, this morning. Unexpected results um, can actually sometimes turn out to be exciting um, in that you look at it the first time, it's not what you expected. And in your mind, because you just keep seeing that, it's, you know, if that's it, the data is garbage, the end, let me throw it away. Yeah. But I definitely say go back to it with fresh perspective mm -hmm. because what you're going to find is that um, as it, whether you show it to someone else or even with your new perspective, you might pull new data out of it. And that's something that recently happened, that actually recently happened to me. Um, which is why I'm very eager to start these experiments on, on Monday. Awesome. Um, so is there like a favorite experiment you like to do? Something you enjoy about love life? We all have our little like gadgets that we like. Yeah. For me, it's anytime I can see colors change um, or just something that's colorful because especially in chemistry and just in lab life in general, pipetting clear liquids into clear liquids and yeah. hoping that something changes. So whenever I can can work with a dye, um, usually you have to cover it up in foil, but sometimes you can see the, the change. Um, I love there's something called a BCA assay for protein quantification. And there's this um, there's a part when you're mixing all the reagents together, it starts off blue, it turns green, you add it to, the, um, to your plate and then it's turning purple. It's just pretty. Yeah. And then you and also when it's turning purple, you know, OK, there's protein in there. So yeah. we're good. Like confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> Is there um, any particular um, like habits you've developed uh, when you do bench work? Colored lab tape. I actually would like to get more. Yeah, um, there it is. It's just blue and yellow here. There's actually this is also gray, but it's running low. <laughs> and I'm also big on fine tip. Um, ethanol resistant markers. Yes, that's, that's so why, hard to find. Yeah, so that's why I have mine, mine taped. I'm, I, I share, I'm a sharer, trust <laughs> me, but I like to keep track of them and there's, I even have two different sizes. Do you like prefer um, a handwritten love notebook or a virtual notebook? Ooh, all right. Debates. I guess you could say I'm old school and I do prefer um, handwritten, like even this, this is a printed out protocol and I just yeah. have a bunch of notes on it. Um, for that reason, like, notes. Um, and then um, in terms of the digital lab notebook, I'm trying to get more on board. I've realized my undergrads do prefer to put everything on their iPads and laptops. Yeah. New generations, new things. It's not a problem. I, I felt some type of way when my uh, undergrad said, uh, so, you know, Simone, paper's obsolete. And then I turned to her and like, are you saying I'm obsolete? Oh, um, no. <laughs> but um, I think I think having a digital lab notebook can be good in terms of being able to pass on to the next group of researchers that come in. So right now I kind of have a hybrid approach and I don't know, who knows, eventually maybe when I have my own group, I don't think we'll fully be digital, but I'll definitely try to incorporate that at the forefront when things get started. Cool. Um, and then what advice have you been given that you found val valuable and what advice did you get that was just not something that you wanted to take? Sure. I think the best advice that I've, I've been given is um, no is an answer, set boundaries for yourself. Um, I'm working really hard on that. Um, I actually just made a post about that a, a couple weeks ago on, on my social media accounts. And part of the reason um, for saying no more often is because I don't want to stretch myself too thin mm -hmm. and overcommit um, because I find that if that's the case, you, you're not going to get the best out of me. Lean into your own um, own knowledge, research, and everything to make sure you are getting what you want out of it. Uh, if you were not doing science, what would you be doing oh. as a career? I would definitely be an animator. 
working at Disney or Pixar. What, what are your thoughts on some of the recent Disney movies? There have been a few coming out. Encanto, oh, oh my yeah. gosh. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, the last um, couple of weeks on social media with songs finally, you know, breaking the billboard top 100. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I watch, so I watched that over the break and um, I cross stitch. It's one of my hobbies. And I remember, usually I cross stitch while I'm watching things. And I remember there were, there were certain songs I would just stop altogether. And then by the end of the movie, I was just totally yeah. in on it. It's so good. Wow, that's awesome. What are your, your hobbies besides, you know, cross stitching? Yep, so cross stitching, I, 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 finally got, I finally got back into that. I committed to that over the winter break because I'd put it down for about a year. But I've completed some projects since then, so I'm excited about that. Um, and I'm also getting into making some of my own designs. Like, I actually kind of want to do something for Black History Month because awesome. there's not a lot of pre-made designs out there, and so I'd like to do one. Um, also, I do um, sometimes color in adult coloring books, but those are the ones that are maybe floral, and then it'll have an adult language <laughs> plastered across <laughs> it. <laughs> yes, um, especially if there's a coronavirus-themed one, which is pretty funny. Awesome. Um, and then I also I do like to work out. Um, pretty much every morning. Um, that's it's just become part of my health and wellness lifestyle and journey. Being in Boston, mm -hmm. it seems like there's only two seasons. But do you have a favorite one in terms of seasons? Um, yes, the two weeks of fall that we have, because uh, <laughs> um, it seems to just jump from summer to winter. I love fall. Um, I really love the the trees changing and the the color and everything, especially driving down the highway and it just looking at the foliage. I think it's I just think it's so beautiful. Do you follow any sports or any shows? Um, sports. So now by marriage, I am a, a Bears fan and a Bulls okay. fan. I see. And a Sox fan, a White Sox fan. Um, most of the time, I'm just staring at the TV. Mm -hmm. I kind of have an idea of what's going on. Yes. Um, but now we've gotten into this cute thing, especially with football. I'll give my own commentary on what's going on. That's, Excellent. that's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> my husband keeps saying we should do a Twitch channel on it because um, ah. it's very entertaining. Um, so there's that. But as far as TV shows, I love medical TV dramas. Mm -hmm. So pretty much anyone that's on the air right now or that used to air, I watch. But I am a devoted, very devoted Grey's Anatomy fan. I know it was better in the earlier seasons. I'm sticking through yep. with Meredith to the end yep. <laughs> and Bailey and Weber. Um, cause I've been watching since middle school. So I'm oh, wow, really, yeah, I'm really hoping they wrap it up by the time I'm done with the post, my postdoc. <laughs> um, and then if uh, there was a reality TV about research and lab life, what do you think it would be like? And would you watch it? Uh, yes, I would watch it. I think, I don't know, I think sometimes what goes on in, in labs can be pretty entertaining because you're it's not just a bunch of geeks walking around in lab coats and just like oh I'm doing this work and yes. funny things happen <laughs> all right the other day we were talking about a paper about how that made an argument that cats are actually liquid because you can put them into a container and it will take the shape of that container right the, the, how did we get there? I don't know. It was a conversation I walked in on. I think we we're actually talking about cats and their nine lives. Anyway, um, but it's things like that. So I think it would be nice for, for, for people to see what goes on in labs. I think that's all the time we have. Yeah. Any uh, in, you know, last minute uh, advice or words you would like to impart? Just know that there's no one straight, clear-cut path to where you want to get to. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of lean into that and embrace it. Trust your instincts. You have an announcement for us. Uh, uh, we will be moving on to your next phase. Your yeah. Phase. So I'm actually an incoming assistant professor of biomedical engineering at Georgia Tech in Emory. Snaps um, for that. Um, yeah. So I'm really excited about that. I feel like we could do a whole other video. Um, it's actually almost a year to the day that I submitted my application. Um, so I'll be starting in 2024. I'll be looking for students All right, everybody to work be with. Everybody aware, Emory and Georgia Tech, 2024? Yep, 2024. Emory Lab is going to be opening. Yep. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. It's been fun.